Uh, if you have a Bible, please take it out. Turn to the book of Nehemiah. We're in chapter 3. Uh, by the way, if you ever need, need a Bible, we always have them out in the lobby. Take them. You can use them on a Sunday, but if you want it, take it home. It's our gift to you. But we know that a lot of people follow along on their phones. So Nehemiah chapter 3, as you find it, let me pray, and then we'll start walking through a chapter that on a first read can seem rather difficult to understand what is here for me today. So let me pray. Father, I am, my heart is full. Sometimes we can get stuck in the, in the weeds, and like Pat already mentioned, we can see things only through sort of foggy lenses, and yet when we step back and reflect, when we take time to think about, about what you have done in us and in this ministry and through this ministry over the last 12 months, we just thank you for your grace. Thank you for your favor. Thank you for smiling on us. And would you continue for your name's sake, um, continue to do so uh, in, in our, our covenant promise to continue to make Jesus known in this city. And, and if we ever lose that as our focus, please remove us. We want to be a people dedicated unashamedly to the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ. You came and you died for us and were buried and were raised on the th third day. And for 40 days you appeared up to, a fi up to 500 at one time and then you ascended and you were coronated and you now sit. You're a living, living Savior who sits at the right hand of the Father. That message never grows old and it's a message, the only message that saves. It's your power unto salvation for all people. So may we always be committed to that and use us, draw men and women to yourself as we carry on in this ministry and as we raise Jesus uh, high and focus our eyes on him. And guide us now as we walk through this text. Uh, help me as I teach it. Help, help all of us to hear from you today in Jesus' name. Amen. A number of years ago, I used to serve on a, a North American church planting board, uh, believe it or not, and one of the perks that came with the, came with the role is that every year for about five or six years, we were um, all expenses paid, uh, uh, taken, uh, sent to New York City, where we had a couple of days of board meetings, but on the front end or the back end and in the evenings, we kind of do the city. And one of the great things is we were always allowed to bring someone along. And so Nicole and I went a number of times, but then I one year took Micah, my son, and my other son, Matthew, another year. And we always did the very touristy things that you would think you would do if, if you go to New York. And I'm sure some of you have gone there. Central Park and, and, and uh, the Empire State Building and Times Square and bus tours and all the places you can eat. It's the city that never sleeps. So you can always do a lot of stuff 24, 24 hours a day. But when I first went to New York, there was one thing that I wanted to do, one place I wanted to visit more than any other, and that was Ground Zero, uh, the site of 9-11. I know some of you have been there, or at least you have, have seen pictures. Um, and so when, when I arrived the first time, and eventually Nicole and I got down there, I was very moved for what, uh, for what I saw there. We'll actually put a picture on the screen, if you don't mind, guys, up in the... There you go. That's, that's one of... Their, Obviously, two towers came down, and what, what they have done with the memorial is that where the foundations of those towers were, they've created this memorial that on all four sides of that foundation is now a waterfall that pours into the hole that, where, the, where the towers used to be. But what really moves, moved me, probably would move you as well, is that on the pony wall, and you can see it behind me, surrounding the waterfall were the names of those people who died at 9-11 or on 9-11, etched there. And so although there are a lot of tourists there the day that I've uh, visited, and I've, I've visited a, a number of times, the, the atmosphere is quite somber and it's, it's respectful, as you can imagine, because there were policemen and firemen there who were honoring those colleagues who had passed away and there were families there remembering loved ones. And so you saw people crying. And again, it was a very somber place, but I was... But I was moved, and understandably so. I think you would be too. It seems appropriate, doesn't it? When, when you think about what this memorial is for, it seems appropriate that when people pass on, we honor them. And we honor them with things like etching their names in memorials or, or tombs, 
tombstones. It, it, it's almost like it's been hardwired into us. It moves us. It moves us, and I think rightly so. Uh, my mom is buried in a cemetery in Surrey, and I've gone back and visited her grave a number of times, and I'm always moved when I read her name. And the verse, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want, it moves me. Today's chapter is a memorial, and it's full of names. And it seems right that it's here. It's also, truth be told, one of those chapters that if you're like me and you try to read through the Bible every year, that when you come across it, you either hate it because it's full of names you can't pronounce and lots of them, and it's full of locations you've never heard of. And so you go, oh man, this is going to be a grind today. Or you love it because truth be told, when you come to chapters like this, you just skip them. And so you go, this is an easy day, right? You just kind of do your finger down the, down the middle of the page and you go, moving on. I, I get it. I get it. But here's the thing. If we were to skip this chapter, we would miss out on what I think is one of the most beautiful chapters in the book of, of Nehemiah. What this chapter does is it describes the beginning stages of the rebuilding of the walls and the homes of Jerusalem. But as we dig deeper into it, and we will, we're going to discover things that uh, are much more important than even that, things that are entirely relevant and important for us as the church today. Let me remind you of where we've come before we dive into chapter 3, especially for those of you who weren't here last week. Last week, where we left off is that Nehemiah, he left Susa, that city in Persia that he served in for the king, has traveled now a thousand miles to Jerusalem, four-month journey. After spending three days resting upon his arrival, he, during the middle of the night, went on an inspection journey and he checked out what was the state of Jerusalem. How bad is it? Got a sense of the job at hand. And at the end of that inspection, he went to people who were with him and shared what God had placed on his heart and how God had granted him favor. People get fired up and this group collectively says, we're in and they're strengthened for, for the job. The rebuild with this group of people begins in chapter three, but like I said, it's full of strange names and it's full of strange locations. So let me see if I can help make sense of it by pointing out some things that jump out from it. Here's the first. Remember, it's a list of names. So here's the first thing that jumps out about this list of names, this group of people. The first is the unity of the people. Unity is all over chapter 3. Why do I say that? Well, when you study a chapter in the Bible or a text within the Bible or even a book within the Bible, one of the things I encourage you to do on the front end before you do anything else is just observe it. Read it. Read it again and again read it out loud, perhaps write it out for yourself, maybe go online and listen to somebody read it for you. But as you do those things and you just sort of saturate in it, key in on those things that perhaps get repeated. Key words or key phrases. Chapter three has a phrase that's repeated so often it's almost annoying, but it's beautifully annoying. And it's the phrase next to them. It's repeated again and again. Occasionally it will read with them or beside them, but it's, it's saying the same thing. You see, what chapter three does, beginning in verse one, is it takes us on a counterclockwise journey around the walls of Jerusalem, pointing out gates and different places but what it does most in that is it paints a picture of God's people standing shoulder to shoulder with the shared goal of rebuilding the ruins. That's chapter three. Let me show you what I mean. Put your pretty eyes in chapter three and just notice, starting in verse, starting in verse two, we read there that phrase next to them. 
Drop down to verse 4. Next to them. Verse 5, beside them. Verse 7, next to them. Verse 8, after him. Verse 9, next to them. Let me keep on going. Verse 10, after them. Verse 12, beside them. Verse 16, after him. 17, next to him. After him in verse 18. Next to him in verse 19. After him in verse 20. Beside him in verse 21. Next to him in verse 22. After them in verse 23. After him in verse 24. Next to him in verse 27. After them in verse 29. Beside him in verse 29. Next to him in verse 30. After them in verse 30 as well. And then next to him, verse 31. See what I mean about being annoying? It's annoying, right? It's really annoying. But isn't it beautiful? I mean, see the picture that chapter 3 is painting for us. I mean, it's beautiful. I mean, if you have an artistic bent, you like seeing images, you like seeing pictures, you like seeing video capturing of, of certain things, then see this. Picture in your mind a burnt, broken, rubble-ridden city now surrounded by a people. Have that picture in mind. People, shoulder to shoulder, working together and rebuilding it. That's chapter 3. But it's in that picture where we are given a living illustration of the call of the church. To do life in unity, to do life in calm unity, shoulder to shoulder with a shared vision to achieve what we could never do on our own because we can't. We can't build what Jesus calls us to build on our own and we weren't meant to live to ourselves. We are to live transcendent lives. That's how we've been created to live, to live for something much bigger than us, to not live to ourselves and to not live by ourselves. That's what the beginning of a study of chapter 3 reveals. But there's more. Not only does it reveal the unity of the people, but second, it reveals the diversity of the people. Chapter 3 is a mosaic. It's a beautiful mosaic of people from various backgrounds, levels of education, societal status, and all coming from various locations. We read of those you would expect to be there, priests and, and Levites. You'd expect them to be there. But we also read of rulers of various places getting down and dirty too. But then there's these other people thrown in. Look at verse 8. Verse 8, a, a perfumer is mentioned. A perfumer helps with the rebuild. In verse 32, just put your eyes there, goldsmiths are mentioned and merchants who step up and help. In verse 12, this is beautiful, especially if you're a mom with daughters, but it should be beautiful for all of us. Or I should say a dad with daughters or a mom with daughters because there's a man named Shalom mentioned in verse 12. And what it tells us is that he was a ruler of half the district of Jerusalem. And it says in verse 12, that he worked along with his daughters. I love that. For all time, God's word records that he and his daughters helped build, rebuild the ruins of Jerusalem. I mean, I love that. All coming together, stacking up broken and burned stones as they shared this building project. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not just locals who are participating. There are those who live in Jerusalem. Not many live in Jerusalem at this stage. Those who live around Jerusalem, but also people coming from at least seven different, seven different locations to help in the rebuild of Jerusalem. But additionally, included in this group of people are those with a checkered past. In verse 4, you read of a, an individual named Merimoth. And in verse 14, you read of somebody named Melchijah. They come from families mentioned at the end of the book of Ezra, the book right before Nehemiah, 
Families that unabashedly disobeyed God's command and intermarried. They married wives from different nations, which threatened the line of David, through which, and this is why it was so serious, through which the Messiah was to come. But here's the beauty of it. Things had been made, things had been made right. And now what we see is Merimoth and Melchijah now living in the grace that had been received by them, serving alongside of everyone else. We should love that too. So what do we have, Midtown, what do we have thus far? We have men and women, young and old, rich and poor. We, we have religious leaders and we have laymen. And we have those with checkered paths, now restored in grace, all working together. Sound familiar? It, it, isn't this the beautiful mosaic that is the church? And isn't this why? Isn't this why? And I don't know, forgive me if I'm, if I'm taking too much liberty in my, in my sort of unpacking of this chapter, but isn't this why they rebuild the ruins not with new stones, but with broken and burned ones? Because isn't that how Jesus is building his kingdom? With people broken and burned and bruised. But when grafted onto him, our cornerstone constructs something, Jesus constructs something so beautiful that the heavenly stand amazed. I mean, we're jars of clay, right? We're breaking down all the time but we've been entrusted with that which is mo most priceless. Jars of clay that Jesus calls his body and his bride. So see the unity here and see the, the diversity here. It's all over chapter three, but what jumps out next is the humility of the people. Everybody is getting dirty in chapter three. People from high society are doing things like rebuilding doors and they're removing rubble and they're stacking rock. And as I mentioned, perfumers and goldsmiths and tradespeople are doing things they weren't tra trained to do. So I'm sure there was an as aspect of maybe the perfumer needing a little help and knowing how to construct a door. I don't know. Somebody having to come along and go, no, you're, this is the end of the hammer you hold. Right, that kind of stuff, because we need that. Because that's not what they're trained to do, but we see this, we can imagine what's going on. People coming alongside of the wall and going, let me help you with that. Let me show you a better way of doing that. The body or the nation coming together. And all of it, big white elephant, all of it being led and organized by a wine taster. That's Nehemiah chapter three. And I think that's great. I was thinking about Midtown in the context of chapter three this week. I've been thinking about Midtown a lot and in the reality, this is our, our one year anniversary. But thinking through this chapter in light of this one year old little bitty thing called, called Midtown Church. Do you know we have dentists and doctors and lawyers and leaders of industry leading kids classes and cleaning toilets and cutting lawns here every week? Business owners, those with masters and PhDs, lead worship or do Costco runs or tear out carpet or hang things on, on walls. Humility for, for something transcendent. But then on the flip side, you know what we have here at Midtown? There are those just starting out in life, but they put their arms around millionaires and they pray for them. It's beautiful. Those from other parts of the world are discipling Canadians here. Singles are counseling marrieds. Love that. That's the church. That's chapter three. That's our story. 
And that's what's being modeled here. Going back to chapter 3, their humility shows up in other ways too, specifically in their willingness to not only look out for their own personal interests, but the interests of others. Take a look at verse 10. We read there that Jediah made repairs across from his house. In verse 23, Benjamin and Hashab made repairs opposite their house. Yeah, and the priests, in verse 28, made repairs opposite their houses as well. That stands out because this too is the call of you and me. This too is the call of the church that we not each look out only for our own personal interests but also the interests of others. Like, don't just focus on your home. Go across the street and help with that one too. That's what they were doing. What also jumps out in chapter 3, but this like red wine on a white tablecloth, is the wrongful dignity of some. It's the, it's the only bummer of chapter 3, and it shows up in verse 5. Look at the bummer of chapter 3. We read there, beside them, there's our favorite expression, the Tikawites, love the name, made repairs but their nobles did not lift a finger to help their supervisors. Why? Because it was beneath them. Menial tasks like stacking rock was beneath their dignity. This is pride. And pride amps up self-importance and keeps us from Christ-likeness. Why do I say it keeps us from Christ-likeness? Because the mind of Christ is the humility of Christ, according to Paul in Philippians 2. And God opposes the proud. Pride doesn't see humility as a virtue, however. It sees it as, a, as something to be shunned. And yet Jesus, who is the noblest of all nobles the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, after taking off his outer garment and bending low and washing his disciples' feet, said to his disciples, and therefore he said to us, go and do likewise. There is no task too menial for God's people because all tasks can be done unto the Lord. And no task too big that God can't use you or me to carry it out if he calls us to and provides the strength for us. And we need to remember if God calls us, he always resources us. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. And tied to this, there is no place in the church where we categorize a, a gift or a ministry as more or less important than another. Paul makes this very clear in 1 Corinthians 12. You can read it behind me when he writes, and those parts of the body that we consider less honorable, we clothe these with greater honor. And our unrespectable parts, meaning secret, uh, less, less public parts, are, created with greater, are treated with greater respect, which our respectable parts do not need. Indeed, God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the less honorable. There's no menial job, no ministry or what have you in the church because all of them, when done unto the Lord, are pleasing to them, to him. And any call by God is an important call because God called us. We aren't to be the Tika White nobles. So unity, diversity, humility, wrongful dignity, but what I want you to notice next as we go forward is the priority of the people. What is the priority of the people in chapter 3? Well, take a look at verse 1. Really important verse. We read there, and I'll just read the half of it, first half of it. The high priest Eliashib and his fellow priests began rebuilding the sheep gate. They dedicated it and installed its doors. Just stop there. Lots going on in half a verse. So what do we have? Well, first off, we have another example of everybody pitching in, beginning with the high priest. The high priest and the priest get down and dirty, 
and they start rebuilding something called the Sheep Gate. This is good because this sets an example for the rest of the people group. Obviously, the Tikawite nobles missed the point, but this is where it begins. But that they rebuild the Sheep Gate first and dedicate it is extremely important. What, what, what's the sheep gate? Well, the sheep gate is the gate that was the closest to the temple. And the sheep gate, as you, I'm sure, could figure out, was the gate. It was called the sheep gate because that's where the sheep were led through before being sacrificed in the temple for the sins of the people. So picture it. The high priest and the priest rebuild this gate closest to the temple, and then they commission it. Don't miss that either. Why is that important? Everyone would have been there. This is a dedication ceremony. Everyone would have been there for the dedication, would have, and they would have recognized its significance, and from there, that's where the work begins, and it goes out from there, but with this priority in mind for all of them. What's the priority? The priority is drawing men and women to the temple, to where they would draw close to God in worship and where their sins would be forgiven by way of the sheep that were sacrificed. That's the point. That's the priority. And Midtown, that is to be the priority of the church today. The mission of the church is to see men and women draw close to God in worship and realize for the first time and remember thereafter that their sins are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Everything flows out from that. And everything is to serve that priority. One final thing to see in chapter 3, and that is the reward of the people. What rewards do we see in this chapter? Well, I think there are probably a lot that we could come up with. I, I think there is the reward of a job well done, right? That's rewarding. I'm talking about just the specific job a person has. Maybe it's fixing a gate. Maybe it's constructing part of the, part of the wall, but there's reward in that. One of the reasons I like cutting my lawn is because there's a sense of satisfaction, like you've accomplished something at the end of the day. When you see the lines, you lawn cutters, you know what I'm talking about. When you see the lines, you go, oh man, I did really well today. And you just, you just love it. There's that reward. And then there's a reward of working together with friends and family. I'm sure when Shalom and his daughters at the end of the day were sitting down and having dinner, I think there was a big satisfaction. It must have been satisfying to do that with your kids. Your friends, fellow priests working together, co-workers. There's great satisfaction in that Two, and then there's the reward of the finished product. I'm not talking about your task only. I'm talking about when the community of God's people complete the finished work of the rebuilding of the, of the walls and homes. More on that in a few weeks because that doesn't get done until chapter 6. And then there's the reward of seeing God working in them and through them and protecting them along the way. In fact, fighting on their behalf. We're going to really see that next week when we get to chapter 4. So lots of rewards. But then there's another reward. And I've already touched upon it. You may have missed it. Their names are written in this book. And... and Although heaven and earth will pass away, their names in this book won't. What a reward. How, how great is it that the Holy Spirit inspired Nehemiah to write these names down for e eternity to see? What a reward. And, and the thing about Nehemiah in the Bible He's not alone in doing things like this. Paul does it a lot. For example, he mentions Epaphroditus in the book of Philippians, and he writes to the Philippians saying, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and hold people like him in honor because he came close to death for the work of Christ. 
What a reward for Epaphroditus. He does the same thing with Timothy, and he writes in the same, same letter, I have no one else like him who genuinely care about your interests like me. What a reward. Can you imagine having your name listed in Hebrews 11 with all of those names as an example of faith forever? Can you imagine? I mean, what? What a, a reward. Sure, sure beats having your name recorded like the nobles who felt it beneath them to join in with the work of God by way of these people. Written, written down for all eternity. So there's that reward too. But all of this leads to one final re reward and, and that is the reward to come. True for the people of Nehemiah's time and, and true for us as well. John, who wrote the book of Revelation, he writes the following in Revelation 14. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds, their works, follow them. One commentator sums, sums it up this way, and you can again read this behind me. Raymond Brown writes, it is a magnificent thing when a Christian believer can leave something behind in this world which testifies to God's goodness in human life. Those who die in the Lord will have this indescribable joy. Their earthly deeds, which, which have exalted Christ and enriched others, will follow them. They will be effective on earth and unforgotten in heaven. And infinitely superior to Nehemiah's project, their building work is indestructible. J Jesus put it this way, store up treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. Seek first that kingdom. Uh, this week at the midweek gathering, Wednesday 7.30 here, love for you to come, I'm going to talk more about rewards because I think people in the church need a deeper and wider grasp of the idea of rewards. If, if you've ever said something like, well, rewards don't matter to me, then you need to come because they really matter to Jesus. Rewar rewards should matter. And so we're going to take some time unpacking that on, on Wednesday, and I hope you can join us. Back to our text. As, as we begin wrapping up, I want us to see something else um, that we share with the people in Nehemiah's day. And something that we actually share with Timothy and Epaphroditus too. And, and something we actually share with all of the people listed in, in Hebrews chapter 11. Do you know what we share with them? Our names are written in a book as well. If you are in Christ, your names are written in a book that's described in Revelation as the book of life. And it's a book you want your names to be written in. Jesus promises the following in Revelation 3, that the one who conquers will be dressed in white clothes. And I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my father and before his angels. How does one get their name written in the book of life? It's only one way. You have to enter by the sheep gate. 
it's, it's the only way. What's, what's the sheep gate? Not a what. It's a who. And Jesus answers the question saying in John 10, verse 9, I am the gate. If anyone <clears throat> enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. <laughs> Do you see why the rebuilding project began with the sheep gate? That, that everything flowed out from this. That the sheep gate is mentioned first. Why? Because all kingdom work is meant to be done with the priority of seeing God's people draw close to God. People draw close to God, which is represented in what? The temple. And through Jesus, represented by the gate, gain access to him. That's why it flows out from there. Jesus is the gate, we are the sheep, and Jesus is the good shepherd who laid, <clears throat> laid down his life for the sheep. Do we, we see what's going on here? Who goes through a sheep gate? Who goes through a sheep gate? Sheep. Sheep. To what? To be killed. Oh, our shepherd says, I'll take it. I'm going through this so you don't have to. Sheep are to go through sheep gates. But our shepherd laid down his life for a sheep. Oh, our Jesus. Midtown, our Jesus. That's why it begins here. Enter by that gate and your name will forever be etched in the Lamb's book of life. As I close, and we move to a time of response, what, what are some takeaways from Nehemiah 3? Because sometimes it can be difficult to, to know what takeaways from a text like this are. Well, let me, let me see if I can help and then we'll respond. One of, one of the things that we've seen from the very beginning, in fact, of the, of, the, of the book of Nehemiah is that prayer is to proceed action. We've seen this throughout. Nehemiah prays, 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 sometimes for four months, sometimes one second prayers, but he prays. But when the call comes and when the opportunity comes, action must follow. And why I highlight that is because what binds you and me together as the church today is not only the spirit in us, but the work for us, the collective work for us. And what is the work? Well, the work is the mission of making Jesus known. Why? Because there's no other name under heaven by which men and women are saved. And that's not simply the mission of Midtown, it's the mission of the church. We are empowered to be whose witnesses? His witnesses. So that in everything, Jesus might be preeminent. Colossians chapter 1. So we've seen that. We're reminded of that. We have also been reminded that God calls a mosaic of people and gives them a new identity. The body of Christ are the people of Christ, and it's a body made up of young and old, rich and poor, male and female, highly educated and not, and those from here and those from the ends of the earth. There's, there's nothing else like it on planet earth. And therefore, we are a family, and we are not independent. All other I identities are temporal. The, the only identity that is eternal is our identity with Christ and in Christ and the body of Christ. We also touched upon what threatens the work of the church, and it always does. What? Disunity, pride, self-interest, and so on. All of those are touched upon in chapter 3, at least get hinted at. Opposition 2, which we'll see again next week, threatens. Opposition that leads to fear, huddling, despondency, and so forth. There's always a threat to the work of God. We're also challenged in chapter 3 to consider what we're spending our lives building. 
aren't we? Paul calls us to be careful what we build because one day it will all be revealed. And one's work will, will be rewarded and another's burned based on what we build and the foundation we build it on. And anything not built on the foundation of Christ won't stand the day. Nothing wrong with leaving a legacy. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with filling your bucket list, but are you seeking first his kingdom? And are you storing up treasures in heaven? And, and are you eager to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, most of all? What, what treasures mean most to you? What, what accolades mean most to you? And last, and as we remember Jesus by the communion meal, we have been encouraged in this text of the reality that those who enter by the gate that is Jesus are forevermore written in the Lamb's book of life. And so I don't know if you'll ever get to New York City, but if you do, go to, go to the 9-11 memorial and be moved by it. But as you read the, the names etched on the pony wall, be reminded that your names are etched in eternity too. Be encouraged by that, by that. Would you rise as we respond? Let's pray, Father. Uh, as, as I've done already today and throughout this week, I'm thankful for this ministry. A ministry where what we've seen in this text uh, is being fleshed out. Unity, humility, diversity, a, a desire to, to fight against wrongful dignity, a ministry whose eyes are focused on, on the rewards to come, building lives upon the rock that is Jesus. I, I thank you, but um, we're a work in progress. We're, we're in the middle of, of, of times of sanctification and we, we, we must fight. We must fight on a daily basis against that which threatens the ministry, threatens this church, pride, self-interest and the like, fear and despondency, looking out for only our interests and not the interests of those across the street, my neighbors, those I stand shoulder to shoulder with. So help us in that, I, I pray. But I praise you, I thank you for this group, I thank you for this local body called Midtown. And, and Jesus, as we come to this meal, thanks for taking the gate for us. Thanks for walking through that gate so we didn't have to. Dying in our place so that we could be one with God. Oh Jesus, we love you. We praise you. And I pray if there are people here that don't know you, I pray that today they would say, Jesus, I want you, I need you. Forgive me of my sins my pride, my rebellion against you. Come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. I wanna follow you, strengthen me, help me. I wanna come to you. I pray for those people that they would say yes to you today. And I pray for those here that know you, but perhaps uh, they're living in a place of fear and despondency and discouragement. I pray that they would return to you today and when they come forward and eat of the meal that you've given us, that they would receive grace upon grace, strengthening grace to go back into the world in which you've sent us. And I pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.